Nick. Um, in this session today, uh, we will talk about opportunities uh, for the Arctic youth. And today we are live broadcasting from the Arctic frontiers here in Tromsø, Norway, within the polar circle. Uh, we will dive into the prospect of the Arctic youth and explore perception on job-related opportunities in the region. We will also discuss the vital role of citizens in the north engaging in geopolitics and high-level businesses. Yeah, and just to introduce us, we are Radio Arctic, and my name is Guren, and uh, my other half is Anna. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have today with us uh, Polina Simjanova, who is a dynamic researcher from Russia with a diverse ac academic background, um, where you are now pursuing your PhD at uh, Tromsø University. Yes, I do. Yeah, um, maybe... Um, can you start telling us and the listeners um, what your background is and what your research is about and what, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. So, as you said, I was born in Russia and I got my bachelor degree there. I was uh, studying Northern Studies or so Regional Studies, as we called it there, but with a focus on Northern Europe. So that was my first experience in the Arctic. I was studying in Arhangelsk, so that's very close to the Arctic Circle. And... Um, I also got some knowledge of Norwegian and I also got a chance to go on a student exchange to Norway. So that was really great. And then I, I got a master's degree from Norwegian University. In so It's called Energy, Environment and Society, but it's pretty much about sustainable energy transitions. And yes, now I am pursuing my PhD and the topic of my PhD, like a very general one, it's called Mobilities and Security in a Change in Arctic. But I can, of course tell you more about what actually I'm doing if you want to. Yes, yeah, please. Course. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm still quite new. I'm just, I've just started six months ago, uh, but I'm looking into the way energy is moving within the Arctic. And by energy, I mean electricity or fuel, anything. And I want to know how these movements are changing now because of geopolitics and because of climate change. So we can think, for example, about how sea ice melting means that more ships can go in the Arctic and carry fuels, for example. And then I also want to know how does it affect security. But I very much would like to go a bit away from national security perspective and focus on human security and environmental security in my research. So that's, again, quite broad, but this is what my project is about. And when you say security, is that um, related to also energy security? Yes, sort of. But um, I think my like what I want to focus on right now, and it's just a start, I want to see how different uh, actors actually speak about this um, movements and what do how, what kind of security they speak about. Because we hear the word security a lot. It's a lot about it now. And I kind of want to um, like do sort of discourse analysis and see what different actors actually um, mean when they speak about security. Are they speaking about energy security? Are they taking into account the environment? Mm -hmm. uh, it was very interesting to hear how some people mean, like when they say environmental impact or environmental security, some people mean that they need to secure an environment, but other people mean that it's security from the environment. Mm -hmm. And like this sort of things um, are very interesting for me and I would like to dive more into this. So the linguistics of... Uh, I'm not a linguist by profession, but I am interested in like, I'm a social scientist. So yeah. mm -hmm. yes, that's what I want to do. Mm. Yes, I, it is yeah, sort of a linguistics, I guess. Exactly. And now um, I know the conference just started, but do you see any patterns within the, the sessions that you've seen today, for example? I actually haven't seen any <laughs> sessions today <laughs> because we had our own program for the immersion leaders. Uh, so the whole morning we were doing that and I didn't have any chance to visit any session yet. Okay, but that's maybe then a great question into uh, the role of the emerging leaders and kind of explaining for us a bit uh, what what is the emerging leading program? Yeah, it's a, it was a great transition. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, so basically it is a program that is connected to Arctic Frontiers yeah. where they're trying to get people who are in their early career stage, um, professionals or researchers, uh, get them together um, and make us do things together, learn new things together and discuss it together. So um, we met um, this year we met in Budo 
so not in Norway also, just out from Tromsø. We met on Thursday, so last week, and we spent two days in Budo. We saw some presentations from Bud- Budo Municipality and from uh, Nur University. Um, then we also visited um, the facility that uh, is used for training search and rescue operations. And then we went to Lofoten, and there we stayed in the hotel and also... Oh, I can't even remember. It, it was so much <laughs> happening this week that I'm almost confused. But we had great presentations from our mentors. Uh, we had um, workshops. We also shoot videos from uh, for the big picture sessions for the Arctic Frontiers. So you will be able to see them during the panel discussions. That will be interesting. We haven't seen the videos ourselves yet. So for us, it will be also a really great experience. Um, anyway, so and then we took a bus to Trump. So, so it was a lot of collaboration. It was a lot of um, discussions and debates with people from all over the the world, I would say. Um, there are people from Canada, from the US, from the Netherlands, from Norway, a lot from Norway. And uh, it's not just researchers, but also diplomats or, I don't know, different really different people who are all connected to arctic in some way Mm -hmm. living in the arctic Mm -hmm. working on the arctic issues so like of course it's something that connects us but also we still have very different perspectives so that's why i think that the theme of the emerging leaders this year which is coexistence Mm -hmm. in the arctic it's great because we didn't only like see how coexistence what coexistence means in northern norway context but we also kind of learned to coexist in this group together which is a very diverse group and yeah it was a great experience yes uh, but um, it's a program that is going to finish when the Arctic frontiers are finished so then we will still be emerging leaders alumni and uh, possibly we will still participate in some events next year but it's uh, not continuous in in the way of like any organization Exactly, but the network remains. Yeah, and the network certainly remains. Yeah, and also the you you mentioned the coexisting in the art as, as being like a theme of uh, this year, um, and uh, what I read was that it is also considering the race for sovereignty, competing uh, competition among business, the voice uh, of local communities, and the ecological transformation facing the region. Um, that's a lot to cover. Yes, and, it is. Uh, it seems like it has been a lot also for the last days and it's still continuing for the whole week. So yeah. it, it finished on Friday? Uh, yeah, uh, Thursday. Thursday so Friday. Like with our different yeah. teams, yes. Um, so how, how how is it to get so much input, or different input from different perspectives? I feel like I've learned so much and also about things that I've never thought about before or barely heard about. Uh, We had the great presentations about seabed mining or about urban planning. So it was a lot of input and um, also from different perspectives in many ways. And I feel like... um, being able to discuss these things, like there are so many things going on in the Arctic, all those uh, races, as you said, and conflicts and climate change. And to know everyone's perspective, I think it gives so much uh, general context. So even for, like, for me in my research, even though maybe I didn't hear that much that is like strictly on my topic, but I get so much context and like how people live in the other part of the world, how people live in the Canadian Arctic, and that's something I've barely knew before. And yeah, it mm-hmm. gives a lot of perspective. Yeah. And in that regard, maybe because this session is about the opportunities for the youth, maybe you can elaborate a bit, like, were there any discussions about this in the Emerging Leaders program? Like, what kind of opportunities you see for the Arctic youth? I would say also that... Also job-related, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I would say that since we are already working in the Arctic, we maybe didn't feel so much need to discuss these opportunities because it means we all already have them in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, it also means that there are opportunities since we are all there and we have okay. great jobs that we are happy about. And uh, yeah, just ask me another question <laughs> <laughs> uh, and are all the um, the jobs related that you mentioned now is it mostly uh, connected to universities or is it uh, faster than that it's a lot of research and like PhDs and postdocs but there are also people who work in uh, uh, 
Coast Guard, uh, people who work in uh, um, what was it called? It's called the U.S. Department of Foreign Affairs. Mm-hmm. Um, so, or like consultancy agencies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so different people, really different people. And not only research, which was also great because I'm mostly collaborating with researchers at this yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Because the reason why we asked this is, is uh, right now there's a lot of young people that are moving away from the Arctic yes. region. Um, and we are very curious how this can maybe, if we can change this mm. this movement. I I will start with saying that I left the Arctic for a while myself. So I went to Portugal for a year because uh, I wanted to experience something else. But in the end, I came back and I feel like I did it because I saw opportunities there. I saw mm-hmm. that there is something that... I can do and there is something that I can participate in that I very much like to do and I do believe that there are more people who want to do that or but maybe they just need a, some sort of a push to do that mm-hmm. in some way and I don't know I think that there are so many positions PhD positions there are so many uh, funding going into the Arctic research uh, for example so there I hope that there will be more people utilizing these opportunities really Mm -hmm. and then we can also yeah talk about different businesses that are opening up in uh, the arctic and uh, then if the if the arctic sea ice will melt we'll (laughs) we'll have even more industries coming to the arctic so yeah um there will be opportunities but um i think what is missing is maybe like a little push to just make this flow Um, and who needs the push? Uh, I don't know. I was thinking a little bit about it before the session and I was thinking that maybe some sort of economic incentive would be nice. Mm-hmm. Like to like in a sense of like reduced tax that would just make people move and then the more people actually come here, the more opportunities we will eventually have because the more people we have, the more infrastructure we will have and then things will just go a different direction. But that was just an example. It doesn't have to be this way. I just was yeah, thinking of any way to make people at least consider because so many people just think that um, it's cold, it's empty, there is nothing there. Like there, yeah, and It's super dark. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> We experienced this week. <laughs> Which yeah. is true, but actually I think that um, there, people find a good way to cope with darkness and um, yeah. It's actually not that bad as some people think before they come. So in this sense, it's also nice when uh, we invite people over, for example, for this conference. But mm-hmm. also um, in the emergent leaders, we have some people from the Netherlands or from uh, France. And uh, maybe they didn't know what to expect. And now they know and maybe they will consider coming. Yeah. And we're always trying to convince them, telling them how great Norway is. Yeah. I mean, after saying here just a few days, we already been... Uh Yeah, quite intrigued to maybe move here as well. Um, totally understand that. I yeah. was I was traveling and I was looking at all the mountains and the fjords and I was, I'm so lucky to live here. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, that maybe lead to like also your own academic background, um, which you have laid out yeah. previously, but... Um, But how do you see this uh, importance of the interdisciplinary approaches in addressing these Arctic issues? I mean, there's the economic, in this, like, uh, yeah. uh, pond, and then there's the social, and then there's the yeah, environmental. I think yes, the, um, it's very important to conduct interdisciplinary research because in the Arctic everything is so connected and ecosystem is so um vulnerable and mm-hmm. like without understanding all these connections it's really hard to actually do something about it and mm-hmm. um we always have to think about the consequences of any actions that we do and for that we need interdisciplinary research no no single discipline can cover all of that because we need to think of social effects of anything we do but also environmental effects and i think that it's good to train Uh, people, especially the young people, to train them in their interdisciplinary uh, approach and skills so that they can do it, so that they are also equipped with knowledge to do things right instead of 
just following the path that has been done before, for example. And um, then what, what would that be, for example? I'm just curious. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm just, I'm again coming back to the example that I'm using in my research, which is the electrification of Melka plant. Uh, so it's a liquid natural gas plant in the very north of Norway, Hammerfest actually. And um, they are, like, the government is going to invest a lot of money now to electrificate the plant that is um, converting liquid the gas to like with natural gas and then it's been shipped to other countries so um i'm what i'm the question that i'm trying to answer with my research right now is like is it actually um viable mm -hmm. is it actually good to invest so much money and make uh, this plant to work so much longer uh, Is it actually sustainable or are we just following the same path we were following before? Mm -hmm. And I think that in this, um, for example, in this case, it's not only about environmental impact, which is obviously huge in many ways, mm -hmm. but it's also the social issues, for mm -hmm. example, uh, jobs that this plant is creating, but also um, they f to do this massive project, they need to build electricity grid. Mm -hmm. And the electricity grid is, um, of course, going through the Sami lands. So then there is a whole issue there. So it's a lot to tackle. And it needs to be, this research needs to be interdisciplinary just to understand all this issue in t and to understand what is the right path, mm -hmm. like what we need to do here and to not do any wrongs. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, do you Do you see that there's already a discussion around this topic that you just mentioned now? There is a huge discussion in Norway. There are big, big debates about so many things around it, about the electricity prices, about the uh, sustainability, about the indigenous people's rights. It's a very big discussion, and that's what I want to uh, follow in my research. Yes. Cool. Maybe um, because uh, time-wise, we are, we are good. <laughs> um, but uh, but also just for curiosity so we at least get that answered is that if you could look into the crystal ball mm -hmm. um, what would you then foresee um, will happen um, in this transnational collaboration I mean we know now that Norway has the chairmanship for the Arctic mm. Council but um, how do you see that uh, the eight Arctic states collaborating um, um, again okay so I do know that some of the work of the Arctic Council is still going on, mostly in written communication. So there are no meetings going on, and which is unfortunately mm -hmm. very, very unfortunate and very sad. Mm -hmm. But this is what has to be done at this point. But if I look into a crystal ball, I really do believe that things are going to change. And uh, what I'm hoping for is that uh, the war will stop at some point and that the power in Russia will change. And then I think that there will be a huge need to restore this kind of cooperation that we had before. Mm -hmm. Because I remember myself when I was getting my bachelor degree in Arhangelsk, there was all the time so much stuff going on, like different conferences, different forums between um, the Arctic states or Barents Arctic region. We had so much collaboration going on. And for me, it was always a really great example of how things should be, not only in the Arctic, but in the whole world. This was like a true example of the global politics being done right. <laughs> And then, of course, it's all um, went wrong at some point. But I'm hoping that we will need to get it back on track. And I also hope to be a part of it. I really hope that at one point I will, I will not say lead this way, but at least will be a part of it because um, I feel like I have enough of uh, connections with Russia and at the same time, um, good connections with Norway too. So that is something that I could do for myself in the future. And I think that it will come back to how it was at least, if not better. Okay. Great. Oh, okay. We just I need to so wait too. a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and maybe also fight for it in a way. Yeah. Is that something that has also been uh, discussed now during your time here with the emerging leaders? Yeah, so we did discuss it in a way. Um, of course, there are also different opinions and such, but everyone is very polite and very understanding. Um, yes, so we discussed that a lot and I expressed this is the same opinion that I'm basically telling to you that yes, now, uh, I think even now there is still 
has to be some sort of collaboration with Russia um, in a way that is useful for the whole world. Um, so we are missing so much scientific data from, data, yeah. Yeah, from exactly. the Russian Arctic. And, uh, of course, I don't want us to help Russia in any way in doing what they're doing. But if we can get something from there... I think we should. And it's not good to isolate the state. Like It's impossible to isolate the whole state. And it's also counterproductive because then you're just leaving something to boil in itself and it's not going to be great for anyone in the end. No, no I exactly. mean, Russia is almost half of the... Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's impossible to... I, I feel like it's impossible to do anything really big in the Arctic or like make any changes in the Arctic without involving Russia it just will not make sense like any environmental um, measures that are going to happen in north uh, of Norway on in the Nordic countries they're not going to work if um, Russia will not do that and then because it's the ocean it's moving all the time so any contaminants that is going to be in the water are going to be everywhere not only in the Russian mm. side and that's probably also super frustrating from for Russian scientists that it they is. also cannot, cannot collaborate yeah. yes and communicate, yeah and a lot of people have to leave Russia also yeah and they have to move to other countries because they can't work in the environment that they have right now mm. so it's also it's really bad for Russian scientific community also yeah. how is it then for the um, uh, indigenous um, Russian ha habitants I mean, how how are they how are they coping with this? Um, I know. Because, yeah, they are. They must be really uh, left behind. Mm -hmm. They are, and I think in many ways they are exploited because these are the people who are very vulnerable, who are, I would say, poor in many ways, and like financially poor and then the Arctic state of the Russian state is exploiting them by offering them money to go to war and then a lot of people are killed a lot of people don't come back and then the communities also struggle of course a lot and yes they're getting money from that somewhat but uh, I don't think it's helping community that much in the in general mm -hmm. and uh, also all the money that would normally go into building the infrastructure or doing something maybe for the communities is now just going into the war so mm -hmm. it's like all the things are just going down sort of yeah. but at the same time there is a whole again a liquid natural gas plant that is being built now mm -hmm. in the our Russian Arctic it's a very really really big one and uh, they had to change the design because of the sanctions but now they're getting Chinese turbines and they are um, continuing the work so of at the same time there is a lot of extraction going on so like natural resources are just extracted from the arctic and shipped to china basically mm. wow yeah 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 so yeah. it's quite sad to think and yeah but About then it's it. great that you're so s hopeful still that, that i am you still hopeful i i i don't believe that it can last that long because this situation with um lack of uh, money and interest really bad infrastructure and such it's gonna come It can't last forever. Yeah. And maybe to um, go still a bit into this discussion, do you feel like within the scientific community uh, in Russia, uh, do you hear um, things being vocalized on this matter? Or is this just really being kept um, uh, in the sphere? I think those people who speak up, they're people who left Russia. Okay, yeah. Most people who are inside are too afraid to speak yeah. up because the censorship is quite hard. And... Uh, um, I read some articles, um, academic articles written in Russia by Russian academics. And, uh, yeah, it's really not, I don't know how to say that. You can see that they may be not expressing themselves or maybe they believe what they write. But uh, I don't know. It's um, It feels like they write what the state wants to yeah. hear. Mm. Okay. Sort of. Yeah. On another note, um, <laughs> how do you see that uh, the importance of Arctic citizens being involved and engaged in, in politics, geopolitics? Mm. I think that it's... From both sides, I guess, from the allies, the, the seven Arctic states and Russia as well. Mm. I think that 
they have to have a say in what is going on. They need to take part in decision making just because so much that is happening in the Arctic is decided in the South. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people who decide they are just not aware of what is going on. I'm just thinking now of Russia, especially like if things are decided in Moscow and then the things that is decided is happening far in like in the Arctic Circle yeah. and like, I don't know, in the Far East. Um, I'm pretty certain that the people who make these decisions have no idea what is actually going on there. And they make these decisions based off the documents that they have from, I don't know, maybe 80s. So I think that it's, yeah, in Russia it's not taken into consideration at all. Of course, in the other countries it's probably better. And I'm happy that indigenous people have more rights here than, again, in Russia, I would say. Uh, but there is still a long way to go in this sense. But those people who live in the Arctic, they have expertise, they have local knowledge that is invaluable, and it has to be used in any decisions that are taken about the Arctic. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that's a nice note also to end on. Yeah, and um, let's uh, keep on looking to your crystal ball. Yeah, I really yeah. Are. I'm envisioning it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Nice. And uh, yeah, thank you, Paulina, for yeah. uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, Radio thank Arctic you for inviting for this me. the first uh, episode at Arctic Frontiers. Yes. Yeah. In Tromsø. Um, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah. Tuning in both uh, live, so broadcasting yeah. all around the globe, but also live to tape here. And uh, yeah, you can follow our episodes on radioarctic.net. Uh, and for some future episodes, we will host another one at 9.30 tomorrow. Uh, so please join that. We're going to talk about Beyond Borders, Navigating the High Seas and the Arctic Governance. And yeah, we look forward to follow your um, studies. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. I'm sure we'll see each other again Definitely. at some point. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And have a beautiful day. You too. Okay, tack.